The next panel is centered around mental illness, intellectual disability, and capital punishment. Denise Lundford is the moderator, and the panelists are John Bloom, Sherry Johnson, Kevin Werner, Richard Bonney, and James Ellis. John Bloom is the Samuel F. LeBouts Professor of Trial Techniques at Cornell Law School and the Director of Cornell Death Penalty and Juvenile Justice Projects. Professor Bloom earned a BA from UNC Chapel Hill, an MAR from Yale Divinity School, and a JD from Yale Law School. He returned to his home state of South Carolina in 1985 after clerking for the Honorable Tom Clark. He was a partner at Brook and Bloom in Columbia, South Carolina, before founding the Justice 360 SC in 1988 a nonprofit organization dedicated to the representation of persons on death row and juveniles sentenced to draconian punishments. He joined the faculty of Cornell in 1997, where he teaches criminal procedure, federal appellate practice, and directs the capital punishment and juvenile justice clinics. He has represented numerous death sentenced inmates at trial, on direct appeal, and in post-conviction and federal habeas corpus proceedings. He has also argued eight cases in the United States Supreme Court. In addition, he has written numerous articles and book chapters, two books specifically about capital punishment and is currently working on a book with several colleagues exploring the history of pre firm and death penalty in South Carolina. Sherry Lynn Johnson is an expert on the interface of race and issues in criminal procedure and assistant director of the Cornell Death Penalty Project, an initiative to foster empirical scholarship on the death penalty. It offers students an opportunity to work with practitioners on death penalty cases and to provide information and assistance for death penalty lawyers. After a graduation from Yale Law School in 1979, Professor Johnson worked for a year in the Criminal Appeals Bureau of the New York Legal Aid Society and then joined the Cornell Law School faculty in 1981. Professor Johnson co-founded the Cornell Death Penalty Project in 1993, and she currently teaches constitutional and criminal law and supervises the post-conviction litigation and capital trial clinics. Kevin Warner joined the Ohio Justice and Policy Center as a policy director in 2019. Kevin is the primary staff member responsible for policy advocacy and lobbying initiatives. He has spent his career working in social justice oriented organizations, advocating for individuals on the margins of society in cities across the country through his work as a Jesuit volunteer, then at Citizens Campaign Network. At CCN, Kevin led grassroots campaigns in Baltimore, Philadelphia, Austin, Cleveland, Columbus, and Cincinnati. Immediately before joining OJPC, Kevin led Ohioans to stop executions from 2007 to 2019. Working alongside death row exonerees, murder victims, and family members, the families of people on death row ignites his passion to reform the legal, criminal legal system. Kevin was instrumental in efforts to ban Ohio's death penalty for individuals with severe mental illness. Kevin holds a BA in political science from Wheeling Jesuit University in Wheeling, West Virginia. James Ellis is a distinguished university professor and professor of law emeritus at the University of New Mexico, where he taught criminal law, mental disability law, and constitutional rights since 1976. Professor Ellis had worked at the Yale Psychiatric Institute and at the Mental Health Law Project before teaching. He served as a law reporter for the American Bar Association's Criminal Justice Mental Health Standards Project as president of the American Association on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. He's now the principal author of well over 20 briefs filed in the United States Supreme Court and argued in Atkins versus Virginia. He has also worked to obtain passage of statutes protecting people with mental retardation from the death penalty in state legislators and the United States Congress. Professor Ellis was named by the National Historic Trust on Mental Retardation as one of the 36 significant figures in the field of mental retardation in the 20th century. In 2002, the National Law Journal named them Lawyer of the Year. Richard J. Bonney and Harrison Foundation Professor of Medicine and Law and Director of the Institute of Law, Psychiatry and Public Policy at the University of Virginia. He specializes in criminal law and health law. Professor Bonney has been involved in public service throughout his career, including appointments as secretary for the National Advisory Council on Drug Abuse from 1976 to 1980, and chair of Virginia's Commission on Mental Health Law Reform. He has served as an advisor to the American Psychiatric Association since 1979, receiving the Isaac Ray Award in 1998 and presidential commendations for his service to American psychiatry in 2003 and 2016. He has also served on three MacArthur Foundation research networks, including most recently, Law and Neuroscience. Professor Bonney has been interested in capital punishment throughout his career. He initiated post-conviction challenges to the first four death sentences handed down in Virginia after the death penalty was reinstated in 1977. Professor Bonney was elected to the National Academy of Medicine in 1991 and has chaired more than a dozen studies for national academies, including pain management and the opioid epidemic. The Promise of Adolescence, 
He received the University of Virginia's highest honor, the Thomas Jefferson Award in 2007. Last but not least is Denise Lunsford. A 1990 graduate of Washington and Lee University School of Law, she teaches courses in criminal law and legal writing at the school as a member of the adjunct faculty. Lunsford's practice primarily relates to criminal matters, Title IX complaints, and the mental health issues. In criminal matters, she represented individuals in Virginia's trial courts ranging from driving offenses to murder. Lunsford also assists and advises consumers, family members, community members, and organizations on issues related to mental health, including civil commitment, guardianship, therapeutic docket, and alternatives to incarceration. Lunsford previously served two terms as elected Commonwealth attorney for Albemarle County, Virginia, and Lunsford teaching experience includes courses at the Oshford Lifelong Learning Institute at the University of Virginia, and is an adjunct professor with the Criminal Defense Clinic at the University of Virginia School of Law. With that, I'll turn things over to Denise. Hi, thank you all for being here and for attending this panel on mental illness, intellectual disability, and capital punishment. Um, I don't want to take too long at the beginning. I want to go ahead and turn it over to the panelists. Um, the order in which they will present will be uh, James Ellis, uh, then Sherry Johnson and John Bloom will present, then Richard Bonney, and finally Kevin Werner. Please submit any questions that come up, uh, come to mind during their pre presentations to the question and answer um, section, and I will get to those once it, once they finish with their presentations. Thank you. So, uh, Jim, if you want to go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I, I deeply appreciate the um, uh, the journal setting up the symposium and, and addressing the important questions about the death penalty and the panels we heard earlier today certainly uh, bear out uh, the decision that you all made to that this was a good time to focus on this. I want to focus largely on the history, but also some of the continuing issues involving people with disability. Um, in particular, um, throughout this, uh, keep in mind that this is, in a sense, um, a tribute to the disability community. Uh, in two separate but equally important ways. Um, one, um, the organizations of uh, citizens, uh, largely relatives and parents in particular of people with intellectual disability, uh, often bearing the label the ARC, which once upon a time was called Association for Retarded Citizens, um, uh, some at the national level, but much more at the state level. Uh, in each of the states where we brought about legislative change, uh, the work was done uh, almost exclusively, the lobbying work um, and strategic work uh, was done by representatives of the ARCs. And they were the ones who made this happen, including in what may seem implausible states. Um, uh, so all, all tribute to them. Secondly and separately, um, the disability professional community, um, psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, a few, um, uh, special educators, others, uh, in particular, the American Association on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. Um, those groups didn't have, they were fine and supportive, but they weren't major players in obtaining um, the, the legislation. Uh, they have become huge players, uh, both in amicus briefs uh, to the courts and in particular to the Supreme Court, um, but more than that, in providing the expertise to lawyers who are litigating uh, these cases. So a shout out to um, the individuals, um, uh, disability professionals who, who help with that. Um, the uh, death penalty community itself has always been supportive, although there was in the early days when we were doing this um, uh, 30 years ago, uh, there was some quiet skepticism in the death penalty community, that if states began um, uh, to uh, ban the death penalty for people with intellectual disability, that it might clean up um, the death penalty and reduce um, the need um, uh, for its abolition. Uh, that wasn't ever expressly argued, uh, but there, it was a, a fear, a concern. Um, we now know in retrospect that that did not prove to be true um, that in a number of states, 
um, New Mexico, Colorado, Connecticut, New York, Virginia, and others, in which we were able to obtain ID, intellectual disability uh, legislation, have since gone on to abolish the death penalty. So it, it, it didn't prove to be um, a hazard to nav navigation toward um, uh, repeal. Let me start the substantive discussion of this with terminology. Um, as you will see, um, Atkins, um, Penry's the case before that, and many others um, use the term mental retardation uh, to describe people with this disability. And my, in my conversation, that will come up some just because I'm dealing with historical matters. The accepted term now is intellectual disability. Um, and the Supreme Court has now shifted and acknowledged that that is the term. So I will use them interchangeably. But as you work um, in, in the field or make um, um, work on cases in the field, intellectual disability is the term that is accepted both in the professional community and, and um, uh, beyond. The terminology, the shift from mental retardation to intellectual disability um, is part of a longer chain of once acceptable terms uh, that now make our skin crawl. Um, idiot, feeble-minded, moron, mental deficiency uh, were all the accept and others uh, were all the accepted terms in their time, uh, which suggests that the shelf life of uh, terminology and euphemism um, in this field, to steal a phrase from Calvin Trillin, is midway between milk and yogurt. Um, that that the terminology changes, but the reason the terminology changes is the animus uh, that many people have felt toward individuals with intellectual disability. It's not an accident um, uh, that the terminology, terminology uh, changes. Um, two aspects of that history uh, that lur lurk in the background, uh, one, the history of eugenics, um, and in our society and the world more generally, um, the notion that people with intellectual disability uh, constitute a unique threat to society and that that threat needs to be dealt with aggressively, um, including death and segregation um, and sterilization. Um, and our history um, uh, with regard to uh, institutions, uh, Willowbrook, um, Partlow in Alabama, um, the, in most of the states, the, disability, the intellectual disability institutions were horrific. And my first work uh, in the intellectual disability field was to be a bit player in some of the litigation um, involving institutional conditions. But that again, just reinforces how strong our societal um, revulsion and discrimination against people with ID um, uh, is. Let me for a moment talk about the definition. Um, and we've discussed this more fully in an, in an article, um, um, uh, three of us in Hostra um, uh, Law Review uh, two or three years ago um, about the clinical evidence um, uh, of how you go about um, doing expert testimony and evaluating expert testimony um, in uh, Atkins uh, uh, cases. Uh, there are three, famously, there are three prongs of the definition they are not equal to one another in importance. Um, the first prong is intellectual functioning, which essentially means uh, IQ testing as a, as a practical matter. And the, the rule, the part of the definition, is that someone's intellectual functioning has to be more than two standard deviations below the mean, which means that people are roughly in the bottom 2% or so in, in mental functioning. But the mere fact that you have a low IQ isn't enough. Uh, to satisfy the definition. Um, this, the second prong is that it must have a real world impact on practical functioning. There must be stuff you cannot do. Note the focus isn't on stuff you can do because everybody, including pe people with intellectual disability has things they can do. But if there are things they cannot do because of their mental impairment or coexisting with their mental impairment, uh, the second prong is satisfied. And then the third prong, which isn't very important, um, in practical cases is age of onset, um, that the disability needs to have occurred or been manifested um, basically in, in birth, childhood, or, or um, adolescence. Um, that one doesn't come up much because people don't acquire 
um, uh, intellectual disability later in their life, um, with the exception of helmetless motorcycle accidents. The, the real world is that these folks uh, had this from childhood. Um, that does not mean that they need to have been tested um, uh, or diagnosed as having ID, but there needs to be some evidence uh, in childhood. That's the definition that has been accepted by the court. That is the definition that is accepted in the disability um, uh, community. Let me turn to the history of the death penalty, or at least the modern history of the death penalty um, with regard to people with intellectual disability. The beginning case um, was in a sense, Jerome Bowden's case in the state of Georgia. Uh, Jerome Bowden was an individual who clearly had intellectual disability, uh, who was facing imminent um, uh, execution and for whom um, a plea was made for uh, at least a stay and ultimately clemency um, uh, by um, a variety of groups who had, who's, to whom his case had come to their attention. You had um, the Pope um, uh, and heavy metal rock bands uh, who are seldom on the same stage, um, uh, but working together um, uh, to ask for a reevaluation of Jerome Bowden. He was, there was a stay, uh, he was reevaluated. Uh, the experts came back and said, oh yeah, he has intellectual disability, but it's really not that bad. And he was then executed a couple of days later. That um, was awakening experience for both the disability community of volunteers and parents, but also of the professional organizations. And for the first time, there was serious focus on the fact that people with intellectual disability had been executed um, and were on death, death row uh, facing uh, execution. Um, uh, let me digress for a moment. Um, there had earlier in the 1980s, uh, Jerome Bowden's case was 86. Uh, early in the 1980s, the American Bar Association had a task force that produced mental health uh, standards, which focused specifically on people with intellectual um, disabilities. We had task forces on this, that, and the other produced standards, which had lots of detail. Um, Richard Bonney will have difficulty removing his fingerprints uh, from that process. Um, uh, this, this was a serious process. The death penalty didn't come up. There weren't standards about it, uh, in part because we were not aware of how prominently um, intellectual disability featured um, in the death penalty. Uh, obviously, Jerome Bowden's case um, changed that and standards were adopted and other professional organizations weighed in after the fact, saying no, people with intellectual disability ought not to face um, uh, the death penalty. Relatively shortly after that, um, the US Supreme Court, for reasons known only to themselves, um, granted cert um, in a case, the first case, there are two cases with the same name, the first case of Johnny Paul Penry. Um, and Johnny Paul Penry um, was an individual with intellectual disability. The question presented in his cert petition wasn't, can you execute someone with mental retardation, then the term. It said, can you execute someone with a mental age of, I believe it was six? Uh, so our first task Editions were particularly helpful with that. Uh, created professional organizations, uh, I believe the ABA, others all weighed in. Uh, Supreme Court held um, that Johnny Penry was entitled to a new hearing on the impact of his disability, but declined uh, to say there should be a categorical uh, exemption from the death penalty for people with intellectual disability. And there were several reasons offered in Justice O'Connor's opinion, but the principal one uh, was that there was insufficient evidence of a national consensus in the public against the in, uh, execution of people with intellectual disability. And then she offered a phrase afterwards in the course of that, which may have been a throwaway uh, from her um, saying, well, maybe there'll be evidence sometime in the future, but now there are only a couple of states. Um, tilting our head and, and squinting just right, we just took that to be an invitation uh, 
um, in the disability community to go out and get sta uh, state statutes. Um, and over the course of the next uh, decade and a little more, we were able to get a total of um, 18 states um, uh, to pass these statutes. Um, um, the um, uh, first was Georgia, uh, followed by Maryland and Kentucky and Tennessee and New Mexico and, and on. I mentioned Georgia because Georgia, um, which was the case in which Jerome Bowden's case had arisen, is the great moral accomplishment um, for Georgia to say, we're gonna limit the death penalty for people with intellectual disability is no small thing. The statute is a hot mess. Uh, the statute is a disaster in, in its drafting. Um, it was great. Yeah, I hate to interrupt you, but um, I think you've got about one minute left. Okay. So get to the other panelists. Thank you. Um, the court in Atkins said, okay, now there's enough um, um, uh, evidence and overturned the death penalty for people uh, with intellectual disability. Two cases subsequent to that that are worthy of attention. Uh, first, Hall against Florida uh, in 2014 said, no, the definition has to be the clinical definition and you can't um, uh, mess with it. Um, and secondly, Moore against Texas, actually there are three, uh, Moore against Texas, the court said that Texas in making up its own definition say, well, we have our own uh, meaning of intellectual disability here in Texas this is what Texans want. Supreme Court said, no, you can't. And then in a second case, a couple of years later, when the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals had failed to get it, uh, the court said, no, no, we really mean it. Um, those cases have been really important um, in litigation. Two open issues that are, that are gonna be discussed by our uh, uh, panelists. One, the standard of proof um, of uh, how, how much a, uh, a, a defendant has to prove um, that he has intellectual disability uh, with George again being the outlier. Um, and and um, uh, the, second, the second issue that I would raise uh, working through um, is comparable lim uh, limitations on the death penalty, in particular mental illness um, that will be um, uh, coming up. Uh, thank you for your patience. Okay, I guess I'm just supposed to start. Um, I, and I want to thank everyone for the invitation to talk here because this is a great group of people uh, and it's really a terrific thing that the symposium is being uh, brought to everyone now. Um, I, I think I should start by saying Atkins was a huge victory. And I think we, you know, we are going, I'm going to quibble about, you know, what has failed to happen, but we can't lose sight of that it was an enormous victory um, and one that was a long time in the making and one uh, for which um, Jim Ellis gets the lion's share of the credit. There are lots of people who worked on it, but um, he, he deserves that credit and, and a nod to him from everyone in the death penalty community, as well as the particular people whose lives you saved. That said, um, the implementation question has been a really problematic one. And in fact, the title of our article um, is, is sort of a play on the prongs, but it's also true. Um, there are still adaptive deficits and uh, Atkins is still in its developmental period. Uh, we, there are a lot of things that are still going wrong and things that still need um, adjustment. And so uh, the paper talks about all of those things. John Bloom and I have been working on this since shortly after Atkins was decided. And so this is our sort of next update. And uh, we're joined here by um, Brendan Van Winkle, our, our fellow. Um, but I think we, so I wanna talk most about the newest piece, but I wanna observe um, there are still huge issues with substantive deviations from the definition. As Jim mentioned, the court seems to adopt the definition of intellectual disability that the professional organizations had, had themselves been using, uh, but there were really, it really isn't until um, a dozen years after Atkins that the Supreme Court says, hey, actually, you, you have to use that uh, definition. And that's in, uh, as, as Jim referenced in, in Hall versus Florida, they say, you can't have a, a strict uh, cutoff of 70. And so um, that's a good thing. You have to take into account the standard error of measurement. That's a good thing, but it's also worth noticing that the Florida Supreme Court has, after some um, wobbling first, has decided that that's not retroactive. And so um, it's a good thing going forward, 
it's not such a good thing for people whose cases were decided earlier. And similarly on adaptive functioning, it took the Supreme Court even longer um, before it addressed uh, the gross deviations from adaptive functioning that Texas had been engaged in and for a lot of defendants. So um, to say, you know, the question is, uh, can, can the defendant lie? Uh, did people think he was retarded when he was young? Uh, can he talk coherently? Those are nothing like what a clinician would decide. And, and really until 2017, Texas was without interruption from the Supreme Court, uh, executing people based on that, on failure to meet that, can he lie kind of prong. And it, you know, it is true. And then it took two times to the Supreme Court for them to actually say, no, you really, really, really can't do this. So, I mean, I think there's, there's still, um, you know, um, there are at least 13, 14, 15 people who died in between who clearly were intellectually disabled because Texas did this. So on the substantive front, you know, we, we have had more gains, but there were big losses. And because of EDPA, we continue to see some of those losses. And so um, I think the, the issue of what habeas corpus review looks like is a very broad issue and it's problematic in all capital contexts, uh, but it is particularly problematic um, here where the Supreme Court has failed uh, early on to say, no, this you have to abide by clinical definitions then lower courts, state courts that have not abided by those definitions, when we get to federal court, the, the answer is yes, but that's, that was not clearly established by the Supreme Court at the time of the state court decision. And so, yeah, go ahead and kill them. And so I think um, there's, there's an interaction between uh, the habeas corpus review and the kinds of problems uh, that there have been in, in the past in in substantive deviations from the definition. But I wanna talk most about um, procedural problems. So um, the court says in Atkins that it is adopting the standard or comes close to saying it's adopting the professional standard, but it also says very specifically, um, as was our approach in Ford versus Rainwright with regard to sanity, insanity, we leave to the states the task of developing appropriate ways to enforce the constitutional restriction upon their execution of sentences. And that's an enormously important thing because, you know, well, Ford, I should say Ford is a case of, of competency to be executed. And the court says like that, we're gonna leave the question of implementation uh, to the states, but it's really not like Ford. And it's not like Ford in several ways. First of all, there's been a long standing common law tradition against executing people who are insane. And so the resistance that might be expected is quite different. Uh, second of all, there are way more op procedural options with respect to uh, intellectual disability determinations. For one thing, they can happen by a jury. For another thing, they can happen at trial. We can, we can have many different things that happen, whereas competency to be executed determination since they happen at the very end, there's fewer procedural uh, questions. And then I think the third thing is that the factual uh, determination actually is a lot more complicated. And that's because um, the intellectual disability determination is often a retrospective one. Uh, and, and that's not true of competency to be executed. We ask what the person is, is aware of at the time of execution. So um, some states, um, most states actually did decide to have judges decide this. 17 states decided that. Um, but and, and maybe that's partly because of judicial expertise, and maybe it's partly because uh, of um, efficiency. Like if you have a judicial determination and you don't have to go through a whole capital trial, but 10 states uh, decided that they wanted to have uh, juries decide this. And if they did that because they thought that, um, that that would mean that there would be fewer people found to be intellectually disabled, they were entirely correct. So um, our original count uh, and the database that we had seen had about 22 or 23 jury verdicts. Um, I've now found there are more like 40 jury verdicts. And with one exception, juries don't find people intellectually disabled. And that one exception is because there was a, an erroneous um, uh, ver uh, instruction on the burden of proof. So it's overwhelming. If you give this question to juries, they don't find intellectual disability. And I think that's because once a jury has heard the entire story of a horrible crime, they're influenced in their determination of whether someone's intellectually disabled. 
both by their prior stereotypes of intellectual disability, but also by their desire to kill the defendant. And so uh, John and I have actually done some empirical work that, that shows that they're biased in that way, but, but the real proof is in the pudding, which is that of 40 or so cases, juries don't find intellectual disability. And then the other um, procedural point that I would note is that Georgia, which was a leader initially uh, on the intellectual disability um, categorical exemption, has a standard of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And that standard has been impossible to meet. So there have been uh, 22 cases of intentional murder death sentences uh, where um, the standard has been applied either by a judge or a jury, and there has not been a single finding that there has been uh, pr proof beyond a reasonable doubt has been supplied. Um, the case of that case is in front of the Supreme Court right now, um, and there is they're going to conference it later this month. And so I think there is some possibility that given um, the the extraordinary way in which proof beyond a reasonable doubt is being placed on on someone asserting a constitutional right, I think there's a decent chance that the Supreme Court might take the case and might do the right thing. But I do think that still leaves us with the jury question. Uh, and the jury question is one that, in my view, we ought to revisit in light of the comparison to Ford, because no jurisdiction has put Ford questions to juries. Uh, and there, there's a good reason for that. Uh, and the reason really is that it's, it's kind of like uh, determining the involuntariness of a confession uh, or uh, like determining whether or not you there's a, been a Fourth Amendment violation. Uh, we don't we don't do that. And the reason we don't do that is because we know that juries are influenced by non-legal uh, matters. And so it isn't a question of whether you give all the procedural choices to the state or none of them. It's a question of which procedural choices really are legitimate choices and which ones stand in the way of of uh, implementing a right that the court has, has acknowledged. And it seems to me that uh, particularly proof beyond a reasonable doubt and, um, and giving this question juries is, are, are two procedural choices that do thwart uh, the, the implementation of what, what is a great decision. And I'll stop there. Thank you, um, Professor Bonnie. Sorry, um, John isn't going to go next. No, he's just here. I mean, I I did the talking. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, okay. Well, all right. Well, uh, I wanted to say hello to all of you, and I'm so, I'm so glad to see uh, Jim and and Sherry and John, um, even by remote uh, uh, technologies. It's it's great. Um, so. Um, the topic I chose to focus on, uh, having in mind the um, uh, uh, story we've just told about uh, um, exclusion based on uh, intellectual disability, was whether severe mental illness uh, at the time of, of an offense should be uh, a bar to the death sentence. Also, um, I think we're a long way from any constitutional ruling to that effect, but it's obviously a matter that state legislatures can consider, and we have a, another American Bar Association uh, initiative that I think has been uh, influential here. Um, and I just want to make an observation that I'm aware that Kevin is going to talk about this uh, in, in Ohio. So. Uh, I have made a last minute decision that um, uh, to succumb to the temptation to say a few words about a case that came up in the, the first session this morning. Um, and I think you'll see why, uh, you know, why I've done it. And even if it shortens the time that I'm going to be able to talk about my intended topic here. Um, in the first session, for those of you that were here, uh, Steve Northup, a good friend of mine uh, uh, and uh, a lawyer who has been involved in this work for decades, used Joe Giratano's case um, uh, as the occasion for reflecting on whether identifying the worst of the worst, uh, which was the, the, the assigned topic, um, is a plausible justification for capital punishment. And Steve's premise in talking about Joe's case um, is that Joe had confessed and been convicted uh, of an awful double murder of a, a woman uh, and her daughter. 
um, uh, with sexual assault involved as well. And that given commission of such a horrible, bloody crime, he must be the worst of the worst, meaning that uh, the crime attests to his uh, irredeemable depravity, uh, I assume, in terms of thinking about what that whole idea is supposed to be about. Um, and then uh, Steve went on to describe Joe's many virtues, um, uh, having known him as I have for some decades now, uh, that uh, crime was back in 1978, I think. Um, and in do, uh, so doing, when Steve went through it, he raised serious doubts about whether Joe committed the crime since he doesn't have any memory of it. And that opens profound questions, of course, about the risk of convicting the innocent and the risks that prosecutors uh, will be so driven to convict the worst of the worst that they will undermine the integrity of the criminal justice system in so doing. And that in and of itself uh, is a compelling argument for abolishing the death penalty, period. But I want to ask another question about Joe's case. I think that was kind of the, what we were hearing about it, um, you know, uh, uh, why, why uh, Steve mentioned it. But recall when Steve's narrative began, uh, it was three years after Joe was sentenced to death, uh, when uh, Marie Deans, uh, again, whom uh, he gave a tribute to, and I echo it, uh, began to have suspicions about whether Joe had indeed committed the crime. And she convinced him, this is now three years after he had been on death row, um, uh, uh, she convinced him that he might be innocent, even though he had believed deeply uh, that he was guilty as soon as he learned about the homicides, and indeed went and uh, turned himself in as soon as he heard about it, that was in Florida, and, uh, and so on. So just to give you that sense of the background. I assume this part of the story made you wonder how, how had that happened? Uh, you know, what was the evidence? What did he confess to? Uh, did somebody else confess? Uh, were, was there newly discovered evidence raising doubts about his uh, conviction? What went on during those three years, right? Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. It's a very long story, and I obviously can't tell it all now, but um, you can, for those that, you know, are going to be uh, still online here, you can ask Joe, because Joe is on the next panel. What I want to say to you now is that Joe's story um, uh, highlights the role that mental illness can play in undermining fairness and accuracy in the administration of criminal justice, and particularly in capital cases. We still don't know in anything resembling, you know, based on anything that would resemble evidence, whether Joe committed this crime. We do know that he pleaded guilty, subverted his lawyer's efforts to defend him, wrote the judge asking for the death penalty, attempted to hang himself in jail, and instructed his attorney not to appeal uh, the direct appeal that is that the attorney concluded was determined, you know, required by law. But he was uh, clearly, based on what subsequently can be discovered, he uh, tried to undermine his attorney's representation at every point along the way. Now, how do I know this? Well, long story short, I was representing Joe <laughs> during those three years after he pleaded guilty and was sentenced to death. And he also tried to subvert his post-conviction challenges as well. So, and thanks to Marie, uh, I mean, I think we were making progress even you know, before the three years was up, but nonetheless, uh, he you know, changed his mind back and forth all the time about whether or not he wanted to continue uh, to, to challenge the, um, uh, the death sentence. And eventually we didn't get relief in court, even though we should have. Um, uh, but that the governor uh, commuted the, the sentence. Uh, in any case, what, this, uh, what the case gener uh, demonstrates is the way that mental illness can undermine effective representation by counsel. Uh, and that is a topic that merits discussion. And fortunately, you can find my account you know, of Joe's case in about 25 pages uh, in uh, volume 73 of the Washington and Lee Law Review, 
in, in 2016, which was published in the, uh, in the aftermath of another conference about the death penalty uh, like this. But what I want to do just to, you know, before I pass this completely, and I think you can see why I, you know, I wanted to do this, um, I'll read the abstract basically to give you a taste of, of, of this. Uh, Joe was uh, on death row for 12 years. He remains, uh, okay, uh, because mental illness and severe emotional distress wholly undermined reliable adjudication of the case. Using his remarkable story as a case study, I illustrate some of the ways in which mental illness and acute emotional distress can lead to unreliable findings uh, and judgments, and even worse, can actually propel the criminal justice system toward a death sentence. Uh, I cover unreliability of his confessions, um, his, improved, his impaired ability to assist counsel, his impaired capacity to make a rational decision regarding whether or not to initiate or continue post-conviction proceedings, his diminished mental responsibility at the time of the alleged offense, uh, if he actually committed them, um, and an issue that fortunately never arose, which would have been comp competence to be executed, uh, because he did want to terminate, you know, all these proceedings and, and to be executed, you know, uh, during this period of time. So you can see there are many, many issues about mental illness and the death penalty that are involved in uh, in Joe's case, and I wish we had you know, time to actually talk about them at some length. So that's what I wanted to do as a digression. Um, uh, Denise, you want to tell me how long I actually have here at the moment? Uh, you have, a, I think, about four or five minutes. Okay. All right. Well, what I want to do is make this transition to Kevin. Um, so um, uh, the, the question is, you know, whether severe mental illness uh, should, uh, at the time of the offense, uh, should be uh, uh, a, a, uh, um, uh, an exclusionary factor, you know, uh, uh, for uh, a death sentence, uh, and not simply one of a variety of mitigating factors uh, that can be taken into account. And of course, when you get right down to it, echoing what Jim, you know, uh, uh, and Sherry said earlier, uh, juries are not very persuaded by. Um, so um, the ABA uh, and multiple mental health organizations proposed an exemption for severe mental illness uh, in 2006. Um, um, it didn't receive all that much attention, I think, legislatively for some, some number of years. I can't say for sure, haven't looked at year by year, but it's clear that some around 19, 2014, 2015, it clearly a greater interest emerged in this. I think it was after certainly having a period of time of uh, the, the litigation and the other cases uh, uh, with, uh, uh, regarding uh, uh, intellectual disability and also the Supreme Court's interest in uh, uh, competency to be executed. Um, so I think there was sort of greater attention, a little bit more of a push and obviously some, some things changed, I think in the general political context of uh, of the death penalty, as we all know. So uh, a coalition emerged in Virginia, even though we, at that point, the Democrats had not taken over uh, uh, the, the legislature um, in support uh, of uh, uh, an enacting this kind of uh, provision in 2015 and 2016. Um, and it also, I think happened, it was happening in Ohio also, again, to set, to set Kevin up uh, here as well, uh, and a number of other states, but I think these were kind of the vanguard, you know, uh, on, uh, on the issue. Uh, and we had actually communications back and forth, uh, you know, as, as I've looked at my emails, you know, uh, between uh, Ohio and Virginia. And if there were time there, I know there's not going to be time for this. Um, it's very interesting, lots of considerations about how to define what a severe mental illness is. I don't know how deeply Kevin is gonna get into it, but there were all sorts of possibilities, which uh, at some point, if anything is published around this, you know, I will you know, set out what they, what they were. Um, so there was a lot of activity. Uh, probably the exclusion would have been enacted in Virginia um, in, tw in 2021, after having been introduced every year, you know, between I think 2016 was the first year, uh, uh, and so on, and uh, you know, clearly, uh, growing consent, you know, growing support, you know, for the idea. And I think we did think 
that it would pass in 2021. But I'm happy to say, for those that didn't know this, the death penalty was abolished in 2021. And therefore, we didn't have to enact you know, the exclusion. I pray, of course, that we're not going to go backwards on that. So um, what I'll do for these few minutes is just to review the, the, the policy context for uh, you know, adopting uh, the exclusion. And basically the storyline, you know, that, that uh, we had an opportunity to put, I, I don't want to put it a storyline, what our case was, you know, uh, uh, as we were trying to convince people. Um, so one issue that we had to uh, deal with, of course, is that uh, we already have adequate safeguards to protect, uh, uh, to prevent execution of people with uh, 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 severe um, mental illness. Um, such as competence to stand trial, uh, the insanity defense, uh, mitigating factors to be considered um, as they must, and ours are explicit in the, uh, 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 in the, uh, in the statute, um, and of course, uh, competence to be executed. So part of the argument we had to respond to, of course, all along the way, and I won't go into all the details of it, uh, was why those were not uh, uh, sufficient. Um, and that, um, uh, uh, you know, let me just see one by one, um, uh, we convinced, I think, people uh, that um, uh, in particular, that mitigating evidence at the uh, sentencing phase when there's a litigated case and the death penalty is actually, you know, sought by the prosecution, uh, the uh, aggravating evidence basically overwhelms the, 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 the mitigating evidence. And uh, if anything, there's also the possibility that the uh, mental illness can be used as a double-edged sword, you know, in, the, in, in that context. So I think that, you know, was the, the, the key element. And of course, we did have the experience with regard to intellectual disability, you know, behind us that this should be, you know, a categorical uh, exclusion based on, uh, you know, basic diminished responsibility uh, concept. Um, another thing which, uh, you know, we allude to in this discussion and, uh, and but I, uh, I think deserves more attention for the reason I just mentioned with regard to Joe's case, is that quite often, if you have a person that has chronic mental illness and the mental illness was related in some fashion to the crime, it also often may affect the, the representation and the litigation as well. And I think this should not be, you know, this should not be overlooked and it by itself deserves uh, more attention. Um, uh, obviously, the insanity defense is accepted rarely uh, uh, and so on. So there's really not much, you know, as, as you well know, uh, the, um, uh, uh, you know, the case for, um, uh, for that. So, um, so let me now, just as a transition point, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to Kevin and, and in Ohio, um, uh, I think that we were finding that people were in principle accepting the idea that there should be some kind of a categorical exclusion. But of course, the issue always was defining it as narrowly as you can do it and as explicitly uh, uh, so that, it, you know, that not every mental disorder would count, for example. So there would be, you know, the idea of listing diagnoses. Um, and maybe that wouldn't be enough because that they would then want to list symptoms, uh, uh, you know, that had to be, uh, you know, undertaken as well. In addition, of course, to the criteria of diminished responsibility that are drawn from the from the model penal code. Um, and I think ultimately uh, the term severe mental disorder was defined in a way that left sufficient flexibility to deal with the tremendous variations and the lack of specificity quite often, you know, in the diagnoses. Uh, uh, but it was a huge issue, and if it ever comes back, you know, it will certainly be something that we will have to contest again, but Kevin has had that experience, and I'm going to turn it over to him. Okay, Kevin? Thank you. Um, it's wonderful to be with you all. Uh, what I want to do with my time is, and you'll hear some things again that you have heard, because so much of what um, the other uh, panelists have talked about is this sort of timeline and the sequence of events that has really laid the foundation for what Ohio is able to accomplish. Um, so understanding the context and how Ohio got to be uh, a state that 
categorically excludes individuals with severe mental illness from being eligible for the death penalty. Um, back in 2006, um, Justice Evelyn Lundberg Stratton um, wrote in an opinion that I believe was State versus Ketterer. Donald Ketterer was a man on Ohio's death row. And so she first raises the prospect of, you know, questioning whether or not as a society we should execute individuals that have serious mental illness. I think that's the language that she used. And, you know, the Supreme Court at that time was not all that interested in that issue. However, it was something that she uh, was disturbed by. So in 2007, the American Bar Association, um, uh, there was actually going back, I think into 2006, as, as Richard mentioned, uh, the ABA has a, a project that's looking at capital punishment systems across the country. Ohio is one of those states. The Ohio report was released in September of 2007. And that report said, among other things, that Ohio's death penalty statute essentially fails to, um, in 93% of the guidelines for fairness and accuracy, it's basically a colossal failure. And at the time, um, that caught you know, some attention. And so um, nothing immediately was done, but in 2011, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Maureen O'Connor, uh, sort of out, of out of nowhere, out of left field, says, uh, I'm going to impanel a, a commission. Uh, it's going to study the issue of the death penalty. It's going to be a joint project with the Ohio uh, Bar Association. And so the state Supreme Court has, it's a super long name, I, I'm not going to try to recall it, but it was, it was a long name. And so that entity uh, prosecutors, judges, uh, a couple of defense attorneys, legislators, mostly judges, more than any other um, sort of entity within that group, looked at the death penalty system in Ohio from 2011 to 2014. They come out with a 50, uh, 500 or so page report, I think it was, 56 recommendations, one of which said that Ohio should no longer execute individuals who have uh, mental illness there were two actually, at the time of the commission of the crime and at the time of execution. So legislators took up the mantle in 2015 and introduced a bill that uh, would accomplish just that. Um, so the whole underpinnings of what this effort was about rested on the rationale that just like we no longer execute juveniles, just like we no longer execute individuals with intellectual disability. And I'm so grateful to the other panelists for drawing that distinction uh, and, and, and talking about how the terminology has changed. So by this time, Justice Stratton is off the bench and she's just citizen Stratton, um, but she deeply cares about this issue and she uh, you know, uses her out and she uses her relationships and she starts advocating for um, the legislature to pass a, a law that would accomplish this. And so, and the rationale again is on um, individuals with severe mental illness uh, deserve protection because they're less culpable, because they have a, a lower um, uh, they're, they're not as culpable because they have diminished capacity. So over the next, from 2015 and, and 2016 in Ohio, we have two year general assemblies. So there are bills introduced. Every general assembly from 2015, then again in 2017, then again in 2019. And each time we get a little farther, we get it out of the committee. Then the next year we get it through the house. Then the next year, you know, we just kept making progress bit by bit by bit. And so what ultimately happens is it took seven years from the time the report was issued to the time that the bill was, was actually signed. And it went into effect in April of last year. Um, but it was modeled after the same processes that we had already used and established in Ohio uh, 
in determining intellectual disability and in determining, uh, you know, it's much simpler, but whether or not someone is under the age of 18, right? You do those things pre-trial. Um, and so the bill um, went into effect. Um, I wanna cover just a couple of data points and then dig into the arguments. Um, one of the things that we heard was from, from prosecutors and from, from those who opposed it was, if you do this, you're effectively ending the death penalty in Ohio. It's like a, it's like a back, it's like a sneaky way to end the death penalty in Ohio. Uh, meanwhile, we said, no, this is very narrow. This does not apply to anyone except for, and then the individual, you know, the criteria. So they said that, you know, everybody's going to get off of death row. Well, to this date, two individuals have been removed from Ohio's death row. So we're talking about about 140 individuals. Two people have come off death row so far. Yes, there is litigation pending in, in other cases, but the two, two individuals have, have um, been awarded relief under, uh, under this law. I expect there will be more, but the point is the floodgates have not opened, the sky did not fall, and you know, Ohio's death penalty did not end as a result of this legislation. Um, I wanna talk just real quickly about um, the specific diagnoses um, Ohio started with five, our bill started with five diagnoses. Uh, what wound up being in the legislation was four. We wound up with protections for individuals with schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, bipolar disorder, and delusional disorder. Um, major depressive disorder was in that. However, a then legislator who does not have a medical degree, does not have training, does not have uh, special uh, special specialty in this area just insisted that he knew more than the psychiatrist and the psychologist coming before, and so uh, that provision was was taken out. Um, I do want to point out that it was it's fascinating how even though Ohio and Virginia are different states, the same argument that Richard raised are, is exactly what we heard from. Uh, prosecutors in Ohio. We heard everyone on death row will file. We heard uh, that prosecution, the current law already uh, covers this and that we're not executing people that are mentally ill. Uh, our system does a good job. It doesn't, it doesn't um, you know, we, we're not doing that. We've already sorted those, those folks out. We heard that they'll be malingering. Uh, we heard that uh, the prosecution shouldn't be required to prove a, a, a negative all kinds of arguments, none of which um, really were true. What we did, we were able to prevail um, through the legislative process, even though it took far longer than I think anyone imagined. Uh, we were able to prevail because we won on the, this is very narrow. We're talking about five, now four diagnoses. Um, we had to explain how um, not, not guilty by reason of insanity is different from from what we're what we're seeking to do, we had to to tease out the difference between two minutes. two minutes. Great, I'm I'm just about finished. Um, we had to tease out how competency was different. Competency for execution is different than what we were talking about with severe mental illness. Um, but I think what really struck legislators was there was an allu uh, uh, Richard alluded to this a little bit when we presented the information and the academic literature that capital juries, when they hear evidence of mental illness, they misapply that. Instead of it being a mitigating factor, they turn it into an aggravating factor. And for whatever reason, uh, the committee members really understood that. And so, um, so that argument, I think, more than anything else, sort of sort of carried the day um, in in Columbus. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we were. I, I believe technically Ohio was the second state to enact this kind of legislation. I believe the first was Connecticut, and I believe the year after Connecticut uh, in, brought this type of legislation, it repealed the death penalty. So, uh, in some ways. Um, I think we, we may be the only state at this point um, that has a law on the books that's specifically for severe mental illness, but um, I suspect that um, you know, there, there may be other jurisdictions that follow suit, um, but 
all of this work lays upon the foundation of the work that people like Jim Ellis did in the Atkins ruling. So it's, it's a building process for us. And we recognize um, that, you know, had, had those important rulings not come, um, we would not have the law that we have um, on the books today. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for your presentations. And I have a lot of questions myself that I'd like, like to ask, but there are two um, that I want to get to that were posted by people that are listening. The first is after Paul Moore and Moore too, are there any significant ongoing sub substantive deviations from the clinical test for intellectual disability in Florida, Texas, or anywhere else? Anyone on the panel want to talk about that? Uh, I could talk about it a little bit. Um, so uh, I think there's still um, a, a question about the Flynn effect and um, adjusting scores uh, based on how old the uh, instruments that were used uh, were. I don't. I, so I don't think there's a consensus on that. Um, I think uh, on uh, substantive deviations from um, adaptive functioning deficits, there are so many bizarre things that people say in cases that it's hard to keep track of all of them. I think one thing that continues to show up in testimony is prison behavior. And you know, the, there's a very clear clinical consensus that prison behavior is not a measure of someone's adaptive functioning, uh, but you see that over and over. And then I think there is also the complicating fact that in some of these cases, um, if you're talking about looking at them on habeas, uh, you, you definitely see those uh, being described as, as not clearly established at the time of the state court decision. So I think, yes, there are still some uh, substantive deviations that are happening, um, not the great big ones that we saw earlier, but there still are some. And and the earlier ones are still um, affecting habeas decisions. Okay. One else? thing I'd like to add on that is it's not a necessarily a state deviation in a statute, but what you do see is a lot of cases that would seem overwhelming lose because there's a cadre of experts that testify for the state in particular jurisdictions who are willing themselves to deviate during their analysis and evaluations from clinical Ooh. consensus. Uh, and you see all kinds of things, you know, there. Uh, the, the one that uh, is most pernicious and invidious, but still goes on, is the idea, is the flipping around of the test and saying, well, these tests are actually racially discriminatory, and this person is Black, therefore, his IQ is on the verge, so I'm going to add points uh, to compensate for the discrimination, the discriminatory nature of the test, and there's no basis for any of that. But people say it and people get away with it and judges still sometimes rely on it. So there, there are these things which aren't necessarily in statutes, but go on in individual cases, which are significant deviations from what the clinical understanding uh, of the disability is. I think relatedly, there's um, on, on adaptive functioning, there's an awful lot of testimony that that's attributable uh, to uh, the person's subculture. And that particularly happens in uh, foreign national cases where they say, oh, he can't do that because he's Mexican or a rough equivalent of that. And uh, that has not been corrected yet. Sort of a, it's not because he's intellectually disabled, it's because he's from a different culture. Yeah, well, because, yes, because, you know, Mexicans just don't know how to travel by themselves or Mexicans just can't. I mean, it's it, there. Some of the testimony is really extreme. Some of it is a little more carefully measured, which is, I think that you know, in his culture, he's functioning um, uh, in okay. normal ways. Sort of on a similar note, um, are states accurately measuring IQ for the purpose for these purposes? And and when I say states, either you know, um, experts for well, the states in general, I guess, use the, the correct and accurate measurement of IQ. Um, I just want to add a, a very quick uh, 
uh, example where I think in some instances in Ohio, the answer is no. Um, a friend who's a litigator um, has uh, represents a man who's, you know, the, the, the state had agreed in post-conviction litigation that the, the individual's IQ is around, I think it was like 65. And so that individual was granted relief uh, and was removed from death row because of an, uh, he succeeded on an Atkins claim. But the state then appealed it and the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeal said, not reversed. And then, so he's on death row today with an IQ that is, I think by all accounts, falls within the range of, of where, he should, where there should be relief. And so one example of an Ohio case that I know of where an individual with a IQ that's supposed to be uh, exclusionary in terms of, of death uh, penalty eligibility is actually still there. I don't want to cut off anyone else who wants to comment on that, but there is another question from the, one of the um, people watching concerning competency to be executed because the Supreme Court hasn't actually explained what it means to have a rational understanding of the conviction, the impending execution and the relationship between the two. How should lawyers litigating these claims try to flush out that standard, for example. Are there other areas of the law that require a rational understanding that are worth referring to because they give it a broad definition? Don't everybody talk at once. Richard, you might have something to uh, add. Uh, well, I, I will take a quick try at that. I think it's probably more than we can develop in the time that we have. And also Jim had something to say about the previous question too. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. Yeah, are you, you, you know, he, he was looking for the mute, unmute. <laughs> it took him a little bit while to do that. Uh, so, Jim, why don't you go ahead and say what you were going to say, and I'll weigh in on the other question. Okay. Um, I'm very little to add on that. This is, again, about uh, the first prong in IQ testing, and Sherry uh, usefully um, brought us uh, to the Flynn effect and, and um, the, the problems that the age of the exam when it was administered is there. There are also junk exams out there, um, uh, group tests, um, tests done in schools, um, uh, in a classroom with a bunch of people. There, there, there are junk tests that um, uh, are not accepted within the professional community, but which are still being offered in some cases. Um, okay, I'm still uh, the, on the rational understanding question. I think the the, the, the best place to go on any of this is going to be litigation around the meaning of appreciation of wrongfulness, I think, with regard to the insanity defense. Those are going to be the kinds of cases where delusional thinking, uh, where people have an understanding of, you know, what other people think uh, and, and can report back to you what other people think, uh, but they know that that's not right because they've got this other view of the world. And that's not a rational, what we wouldn't think of is a rational understanding of the world because it's psychotic thinking. I mean, I think that's it. And those kinds of issues do arise in, 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 in insanity, you know, types of cases. But, uh, but I would think that would be the, you know, the place to go to try to get an understanding about what, what do we mean by, you know, rational uh, understanding. And, and I think of one of the cases, I can't now remember what the Supreme Court's cases were, I think, you know, the, the statement was, uh, I know that they are thinking that they are executing me because I committed this crime. But I know that the real reason is because they want to stop my preaching. I think I'm remembering the facts, you know, correctly. And I think that's an example, you know, that that's not a rational understanding of why people are trying to execute you. Um, so he knew he had a factual understanding, but he didn't have a rational understanding. I mean, I think that's the point. Yeah, that's from Scott Panetti's case. Panetti versus Court. You know, I haven't thought about this before, but it seems to be that if you were looking for other examples, it might be in a waiver. I mean, if you think about uh, when a, whether a person understands Miranda rights and whether they have waived them, 
you might, or whether a person has waived their rights when they plead guilty, there may be useful comparisons in, in those areas about not just whether you can repeat the words, but whether or not you understand yeah. them. That's a, that's a good thought, thank you. Um, Richard brought up and a couple, couple of the other panelists talked about issue, trial related issues. Um, do you think attorneys are doing a better job of recognizing issues of intellectual disability and serious mental illness so as to get experts and start exploring these issues in death penalty cases or just in, in general? I'll say I think the answer is yes. Virginia is a testament to this, really. You know, once they developed the capital trial unit, you had a capital trial unit with lawyers who were, you know, had lots of experience in dealing with people facing serious capital crimes. And it wasn't amateur hour all the time, you know, that, that then you saw attorneys, they understood what it, you know, what the, what the goal was. They understood the prevalence of mental illness in their client base. They had teams of mitigation specialists and investigators. Uh, who could both develop the evidence, you know, and establish a relationship of trust with the client. Uh, so the clients would be more forthcoming uh, about all this. I mean, I think that's, it was that process is what really broke down the death penalty in Virginia. Uh, they would get into cases early, they would investigate, they would litigate, they would negotiate, they would resolve. Uh, and I think you have seen in states, I know there's going to be a panel about this tomorrow, I think, so I don't want to steal their thunder. But I think if you see in states where they've gone with this and they've gone with specialized capital trial units, the number of death sentences drops down uh, uh, really significantly. Uh, and the number of capital trials actually does too, because they do the work, they get in there, they convince the prosecutors, either you shouldn't kill this person because it's wrong, or you're not going to be able to kill this person because it's going to be a dogfight. We've developed a strong case in mitigation, which will work. So I would say Yes and no, but I think there are states like Virginia, which are great testaments to this. I just want to add on onto that real, real briefly, Jim. I'm sorry. Um, I, I, this is anecdotal, and it's early days in in Ohio's experience with this. But I would, I would dare say that I think prosecutors are thinking twice when they are are deciding whether or not to bring a capital bring capital specs in a in a case if mental illness is. A contributing factor if there's an an undertone um, I, I really do because I think now that there is a tool that defense lawyers can use to say pre-trial no no judge we can't proceed this is not a capital trial because and then um, proceed with um, with their argument um, I, I really do think that it it has changed the types of cases the types of individuals who are being charged with capital crimes in Ohio um, early days, but that's, that's, I think, part of what the intended effect is. If I could add just one uh, uh, point on, on the, the question of uh, individual representation in cases, uh, there's description, uh, description very helpfully of the wonderful things that were done by the capital unit in, in Virginia and in other places. There's also the underside of that in cases um, uh, less noticed in which the defense counsel doesn't get it, um, doesn't get that the person has intellectual disability and a major contributor to make sure that the de defense doesn't know that the person has intellectual disability is the defendant with intellectual disability. Uh, there is a strong impetus in life generally for people with ID to mask their disability. They've discovered they will do better in life if people don't think they're dumb um, and for whatever reason, including not being so um, intellectually um, uh, uh, strong, uh, it doesn't occur to them that this is not an occasion to keep doing that. Um, and so we've seen a bunch of cases in which defense counsel, uh, particularly at the trial level, said, gee, if I'd only known. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, we've had some discussion in this panel as well as the, the one before about um, sort of just general issues representing clients with um, mental illness or intellectual disability for a number of reasons. And, and, and I think all of us who have done that work have experienced that. Um, I think we're 
we're just about out of time. If, then, if we do have a lot, if we do have more time, if someone can send me a message and let me know. Um, <laughs> otherwise, I, I think we, we are about out of time. I want to thank everybody for their participation on this panel. Um, and I'm, I'm honored to have been a part of it. Um, and thank you, Washington and Lee, for, for hosting this. Yes, thanks very much. I enjoy participating. It's good to see a lot of these familiar faces back again. Thank you all. That was a wonderful panel. Uh, we're going to take a short 15 minute break. Uh, for those of y'all that are virtual, we'll see you at 430. And anyone that's in person at the law school, we'll see you in the moot courtroom. <laughs>